Tonight, breaking news on Jeffrey Epstein. Jeffrey was dirty. He was sick. He was a pedophile. Gillen, she is the wicked one. Gillen Maxwell, his socialite ex-girlfriend, now behind bars, charged with allegedly aiding Epstein's abuse. The monster Jeffrey Epstein that everyone came to know would not have existed but for Gillen Maxwell. Does she have secrets? About the rich and famous to save her own skin? Yes, I do. You tell us your full name for the record. Jeffrey Edward Epstein. 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 Jeffrey Epstein, the billionaire sex offender. Do you have any remorse? If the FBI had listened to me in 1996, there would have been no more victims. Just have to massage some old dude. There will be two in your box. They'll be 20 minutes not a big deal nobody really cared that there were young girls walking into the back of this old man's mansion and i was like whoa he had to have seen my terror i'm 1000 percent sure he knew that i was scared to death and i think he liked it he was definitely molesting underage girls on a daily basis multiple times a day and everybody was okay with it Whoever attacks Jeffrey Epstein, he attacks back. The girls would call my office saying, I was just followed home from school by a black Lincoln navigator. The more that the story unfolded, the sort of crazier it became. The story of Jeffrey Epstein does not exist without Ghislaine Maxwell. Today we announce the arrest of the villains in this investigation nearly a year to the day since jeffrey epstein was arrested and charged in a sex trafficking enterprise his longtime companion the british socialite Ghislaine maxwell herself was arrested we begin with the fbi's arrest of jeffrey epstein's longtime associate Ghislaine maxwell maxwell stands accused of recruiting underage girls for sexual abuse maxwell played a critical role in helping epstein to identify a friend and groom My victims for abuse it is a real long time coming the monster jeffrey epstein that everyone came to know would not have existed but for gillette maxwell gillette maxwell had been living out of the public eye she had been rumored to be in europe she was rumored to be out in california finally the fbi tracked her down in new hampshire agents said she was living to my knowledge the first person to ever complain to law enforcement about Jeffrey Epstein or Ghislaine Maxwell was Maria Farmer. She did something, just nobody listened. My name is Maria Farmer and I first reported Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell in 1996. I'm painting these beautiful survivors, these women. You can see not only their outward beauty, but their inward beauty. With each person I'm drawing, I realize that's another person who was harmed. And each one of those should have never happened because I reported it so many years before. I first met Jeffrey Epstein in 1995. So I'm 25 years old. I had just graduated from New York Academy of Art and all the students have a show. He went to shake my hand and he said, you're so talented, I love your painting. This is the painting that Jeffrey Epstein purchased the night I met him. It didn't take long after the first connection that Jeffrey Epstein offered Maria Farmer a job. Maria was initially hired to collect art for Epstein, but that quickly morphs into a role where she's signing in guests in the front entrance of his townhome, which is one of the largest private homes in Manhattan. I really kind of admired him because he would tell the story about growing up in Coney Island and how he created this entire empire he had built. Epstein did not grow up with money. He grew up in a working class household. Epstein had a reputation for being extremely intelligent and gifted at math. I was always very good at mathematics before I made you It was solved in puzzles. It's a strange feeling when you get the right answer to a puzzle. He never graduated from college. However, he was able, because of his intelligence, to find work at the Dalton School 
on the Upper East Side in Manhattan. Dalton is a private school on the Upper East Side that's historically been associated with the tippity top of the one percent. He found what I think was a brilliant way to meet rich people, which is through their children. Epstein's rise begins, you know, at this school. He manages to use that as a springboard to get a job at Bear Stearns. Here's a guy who was smart, charming, cunning. He knew how to run people and get what he needed from them. During his time at Bear Stearns, he had met a client of Bear Stearns named Leslie Wexner. Epstein and Mr. Wexner become really close friends in those early years. And Leslie Wexner is a billionaire. He's the founder of the limited company. And Epstein ultimately began managing millions of dollars in wealth for not just Mr. Wexner, but for his entire family and their fortune. Now, exactly what he did with that money is unclear. I don't know much money. Jeffrey Epstein's relationship with Les Wexner changes his financial situation. He becomes this ultra-rich, mega-rich guy. It's not long after Epstein starts working for Wexner that he begins to acquire this vast portfolio of luxury properties around the world. My own island, my own ranch. I can take the sports I want to take. I can do the work I want to do. I can see the Epstein then meets this woman who becomes pivotal in his life. Her name is Ghislaine Maxwell. He met her through a mutual friend in New York. Ghislaine Maxwell is the daughter of a disgraced media tycoon named Robert Maxwell. Robert Maxwell owned the Daily News, owned a bunch of tabloids in London. Ghislaine Maxwell meets Epstein at a vulnerable time in her life. Her father has just passed away. He was disgraced dead after falling off their yacht and she's also in financial struggles galen has a social entree to many of the world's most powerful and richest families nbc unearthed this video from 1992 and it's taken at mar-a-lago and in the foreground you see donald trump and jeffrey epstein and in the background there's galen maxwell she has a lot of connections, but she had no money. Jeffrey Epstein had a lot of money, but he had no connections. And so they developed this bond where each had something that the other one needed. By most accounts, their boyfriend and girlfriend, I mean, I use that term pretty loosely because certainly they had a very open relationship. Helen was 100% the lady of the house at Jeffrey's. Maria Farmer in a lawsuit alleges while she was working the front at Epstein's townhouse, she started seeing things that concerned her involving Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell. Ghislaine Maxwell would go out on these drives to procure models. She would say, these are the new vials. I need the new vials. That was her word. She would bring them to Jeffrey Epstein's mansion. And they were just walked up one at a time and they had a certain amount of time upstairs and then they were brought down i asked you Lynn, why are you always going out to fetch children she made it clear jeffrey worked for les wexner and they were just what was wrong Rhea farmer says that basically everything she thought she knew about epstein and maxwell changed drastically in one night she says she was called into epstein's bedroom and Jeffrey was lying there on the bed with socks on and boxers. And he goes, sit right here. And I thought, oh, God. And I sat down and Ghislaine got on the other side of me. Maria Farmer in her lawsuit alleges that Epstein and Maxwell then violently sexually assaulted her. I remember being in a lot of pain. I remember having some bruises. They didn't get my clothes off. They tried. I was in an absolute panic to the point where I was able to get myself up and get out of that room. And Gillian came after me, but I, I, I literally took these big pieces of furniture and I pushed them against the doors. After this alleged assault, Maria's done with Epstein and Maxwell. She wants nothing more to do with them. But what she says, she begins to get threatening phone calls from Maxwell. She also claims that both Epstein and Maxwell are harassing her and trying to ruin her art career. The way I'd been treated made it very clear to me 
there is something else going on. Maria realizes this wasn't somebody who's interviewing people for Victoria's Secret. Maria files a police report against Jeffrey Epstein. And then Maria calls the FBI. And I said, are you taking me seriously? And he said, yes, I'm taking you seriously. If the FBI had listened to me in 1996, there would have been no more victims. It would have prevented the massive destruction that Jeffrey Epstein caused. None of this stuff in Florida would have ever happened. I was 14 years old. I was 16 years old. I was 14 years old. Would you agree that you exchanged money for sexual gratification with at least 50 girls at your Palm Beach mansion? setting. He's just a dirty old man. It will 
won't be 200 bucks. It'll probably be 20 minutes. Not a big deal. Because Christmas was right around the corner. Being one out of seven kids, I wanted to get everybody a present. $200 to me was a lot of money. $200 meant I could go to the mall with my friends if I wanted to. $200 meant that I could have food for the week. She was saying he's going to ask you to take your shirt and your pants off, uh, but don't worry, you can keep your underwear and your bra on. And I just remember thinking, like, okay, well, you know, I go to the beach uh, in a bathing suit, and that shouldn't be that big of a deal. She's like, yeah, he might make you take your shirt off, but it's not a big deal. He just likes to look. I really hadn't exposed myself like that before. I still went in the bathroom to change in front of my girlfriend, so I was very, very worried for some reason i was told that he was like a brain surgeon he was a doctor of some sort i knew he had money i just had i had no idea who he was though the popular girl she started dressing me doing my hair doing makeup i was so underdeveloped and younger looking that he was gonna like that it's pretty much what she told me she's like he's gonna think you're beautiful a cab came to her house and picked us up I just remember going over the bridge at that time. It's like almost like an awestruck of just the nice houses, the beautiful boats in the water as you're driving by. As we were getting closer and closer is when I started wondering like, well, where are we? Why are we pulling into someone's house? At this time, I still thought that I was going to like a building of a bunch of old guys. I started to get really, really nervous. I was freaking out. My heart was starting to race. That feeling you get where you know something bad is about to happen. It's like a car accident. You see it coming, but you can't stop anything that's going to happen because it's just going to hit you. very few people but it's extremely private once the cab pulls up to his house we all got out of the cab there was the guy outside trimming flowers but nobody looked up nobody really cared that there were young girls walking into the back of this old man's mansion we were let in by a couple of ladies tall blonde tan we went into the kitchen we stood there i was very nervous on what was getting ready to happen. With each of these underage minor females that was brought to your house, your method of sexually exploiting them was nearly identical. Is that correct? Typically, first time appointment, the girls would be led up a stairway into Jeffrey Epstein's bedroom. We we're going up a spiral staircase. The lady she's giving me like a rundown of what's supposed to be happening uh jeffrey's gonna be in there uh he's gonna be on the phone just do what he asks all i kept looking at was the massage table when we walked in jeffrey just comes in and lays on the massage table he just seemed like he was a business guy well fit clean cut might have played tennis. He would instruct the new girl as to how he wanted to be massaged, where to start, what motion. By presenting it like it's a legitimate massage, it's not going to set off any radar. It's going to seem maybe a little weird or unconventional, but not necessarily threatening or dangerous. They turned on that timer when I got in there, and so I was like, okay, he's just going to be lying just like this. Not a big deal. The moment that he walked into the room, it was almost like an excitement. A weird grin on his face that he knew he was doing something he wasn't supposed to do. There is absolutely no way in my mind that he could have thought that I was 18. I was really little and short and tiny. I had braces. Um, I'd look like an innocent 14-year-old. When he came in, 
had to take my bra off and my pants off. I was allowed to stand there in my underwear. That's what it was told to me. He was just kind of like staring at me like a weird, weird old guy would. Just kind of like I was like a fun toy for him. He opened up his towel and he was completely nude and he started telling me, come closer to me. And he was touching my breasts and I remember him telling me, you're such a beautiful woman. And at this time, I did not think I was a woman at all. <laughs> I just thought that I was like the, a girl. This part of the process is almost identical every single time. He would typically flip over and he would start masturbating himself. When you're 14 and you go through something like that, it's just so much to take in all at once. I was like, this is not happening right now. I was definitely nervous. The whole thing was just not a good feeling. He started trying to rub his finger along my underwear line when I told him no. Um, he just told me, if you take them off, I won't touch you. So I took my underwear off and I ended up being completely naked in his room. He tried like pushing my panties to the side. When he tried to do that, I just, I backed up and I went like this and I was like, whoa. And he had to have seen my terror on my face. And I'm like, oh my gosh, uh, is this a uh, buzzer gonna go off at any point? He was very good about gauging where the line was, how far he could get this person to go. If she removed her top, all right, take off your bottoms. I just felt like I had to, I didn't have an option. Like, what was I gonna do? I was the only one in the room with him. Like, where was I gonna go? If I screamed, who was gonna hear me? Who was gonna come? I felt very frozen. He was an older man with a lot of money and they were children. And so you have this automatic sort of pull to obey, to follow instructions. I was living second by second, hoping that I would see the other side of that door. And I'm 1000% sure he knew that I was scared to death to be there. And I think he liked it. And then, like, the timer went off, and then he said, there's $200 for you. And he wiped off with the towel and walked out. It was very, like, he was done. Bye. I remember just, like, walking down the stairs after it was all done and just being, like, just feeling so disgusting and shameful. But, and then in the same way, you know, I had $200 that I didn't have before. Coming back here ever again. I had never been touched like that by anybody. Not a boy that I liked or nor anybody else. I cried the whole way home. I was just thinking about I'm never going to let anybody touch me again. The investigation really starts as a result of this one call from a concerned parent. There was an incident that occurred with one of my stepdaughters. I need information on this gentleman. All right, he's got money out the union that he can do whatever with money, and he basically does this with a lot of teenage girls. March 2005, and the Palm Beach police hear from a concerned parent. It was an incident that occurred maybe like three, three and a half weeks ago with one of my stepdaughters. This woman tells police that her stepdaughter has a lot of money on her, and she can't explain where it came from. She had over $300 on her. So her family becomes very suspicious about the fact that she has all this cash. She ultimately comes clean about what's happening. Her daughter had been paid some money to go to 
house on Palm Beach and perform a massage on an older man. She eventually admitted that there was undressing involved and some type of inappropriate contact. I wasn't quite sure if there was an investigation or if you guys were, this is the first I'm hearing of it. I'm going to initiate this report and we're going to try to establish jurisdiction on this. Okay. okay. Monday morning, they told me about the case. The next thing that needs to happen is police will interview that 14-year-old girl. Well, you said that you straddled him. What do you mean by that? I was going to throw all the stuff, but a little bit of stuff. I'm going to put underwear in a bowl. Okay. Immediately, we began surveilling Epstein's house to see whether or not there were other victims we had 24-hour surveillance. Certain other techniques they used were trash pulls. They uncovered very valuable information. Message pads with names and phone numbers. You have high school girls calling saying, hey, I'm coming over at this time, or I'm bringing a new call. She would like to speak with you. And the next person they spoke to was the girl that brought the 14-year-old there how many girls have you brought to? Oh, um, a lot. A lot. She originally started out as a recruit and then turned into a recruiter. Every girl that meets Jeff, we start off with giving him a massage. The more you do with him, the more you make. If you let him do things to you, you're going to make more. Like do things you mean, touch you? Yeah, <laughs> touch you in inappropriate places. I was one of the girls that refused to do that. So after that, he's like, you know what? He's like, listen, I'll pay you $200 for every girl that you bring to me. She was able to explain what the scheme was, how it was that Jeffrey Epstein was accessing this number of girls. So it's like, it's like a train. It's like, I used to bring them to all my friends, and then to bring her friends. It goes on and on like that. Who else was underage? Under 18? All of them. All of them? He told me the younger the better. Definitely the younger the better. Just as that woman in the police video, Courtney Wilde at age 14 says that Epstein convinced her to go out and recruit other girls for him. Because I was so young and basically homeless, I felt like it was an opportunity for me to like get on my feet. This is the neighborhood that I lived in when I met Jeffrey Epstein. It is a trailer park. Some of the girls that I brought to Jeffrey's, you know, lived here as well. Two, three hundred dollars is a lot to somebody that's from this neighborhood. He would have one of his cars pick us up and they would pick us up at the front of the neighborhood right here. He just wanted the new face and the new girl. That was his addiction. And it was very much like an addiction. He would just hound me and call me and say, hey, you know, do you have any girls? Do you have any girls? One distinctive time, I brought a girl there. And when she came downstairs, it was clear she was traumatized. Something definitely happened that she was not okay with. I hold such an extreme amount of guilt for bringing these girls. He really just had middle schoolers and high schoolers all over Palm Beach running around and trying to recruit for him. He was the client, he was the pimp, and he was the pedophile. Jeffrey Epstein could not have done this alone. According to the police records in the case, many of the girls Sarah Kellen was one of the main females that he used that was an assistant of his. Sarah Kellen was Jeffrey Epstein's main scheduler of massages. He would literally have three a day lined up all the time. Nine o'clock, another one at 12, and another one at four. He would always have staff there. I would get this food made for me. We would see all these people that worked for him, all these adults, and nobody looked at us like, hey, what are you doing here? He was definitely molesting underage girls on a daily basis, multiple times a day, and everybody was okay with it. Now that I look back, I always think, why was I okay with it? It just became normal. She isn't 
indoctrinated to believe when she's very young that this is just what the rich and powerful do. Once you train a 14 year old that this is okay, you've groomed her perfectly. He absolutely knew that we were investigating him, so we moved very quickly after that. Anybody who ever attacks Jeffrey Epstein, he attacks back. When you know how to perform surveillance, you know how to pick up what's being performed on you. The girls would call my office saying, I was just followed home from school by a black Lincoln navigator just going slowly behind me. person I was living in a world of like rainbows sunshine unicorns butterflies and then when this happened it was more like you can't trust anybody started like sleeping with people being coming very angry I was gonna be the one that used people and made them feel like she started to change quite a bit. Very emotional, throwing a lot of temper tantrums. We're thinking, okay, well, she's a teenage girl. She's 16, you know. It's just a phase she's going through. A lot of times, what girls will choose to think is, this is my fault. And so I'm not going to tell her. I didn't say anything to anybody except my best friend for a year until the police showed up at my door. And I was thinking, oh my God, I cannot believe that somebody knows. So at that point, I had to go and tell my mom what happened. Things in the past started making a lot more sense. As a mother, you feel like, why couldn't you protect her? Why didn't she tell me? I've listened to the recording of me talking to the detectives. He went back to my I could hear how little I was and how, like, afraid. I felt really bad for that little girl. All right. During the course of the investigation, the Palm Beach police documented interviews with about two dozen potential victims and witnesses. I'm investigating a case. I believe that you have information on Jeff Epstein. Okay. okay. The Palm Beach police, as they're going through their investigation, they find like a network going through these schools of victims being recruited. Half of the school knows about it. Half of the school knows about it. All of the victims had basically the same story of what they were asked to do and what they did and what happened. Did he offer you more money to do more things? Yeah. A hundred dollars more just to do a show. Two hundred dollars for a minute. That was a lot. I think we all saw me in six bucks an hour. If I can close my eyes and do something else. I knew it would be a big case. And so that's why I told the state attorney about it. State Attorney Barry Krischer, at the time, was very highly regarded, and he was known as a tough prosecutor. I told him that this is a 50-some-year-old man with very young female children. He asked me the person's name. I told him it was Jeffrey Epstein, and he said, I never heard of the guy. He said, we'll put this guy away the rest of his life. It'll be easy for us. Police were able to get a search warrant and go into his home to try to retrieve any relevant evidence. So they went room to room in the house and videotaped it. Jeffrey Epstein was tipped off on the search warrant. The computers had all been removed. Still, there were message pads. 
they had everything they needed to paint this guy as a 20-year jailbird. It was mind-boggling. Epstein decides he's going to turn the tables, and he's going to make sure that the alleged victims and even the investigators are being looked at. Anybody who ever attacks Jeffrey Epstein, he attacks back. When you know how to perform surveillance, you know how to pick up when it's being performed to you. I was under surveillance, as was the lead detective, for at least three months, pretty much 24 hours a day. For a sitting police chief, that's pretty unusual. Many of these girls were followed. They were threatened. Jeffrey Epstein's private investigators, they were trying to get information. They wanted me to talk to them. But it was definitely intimidation, harassment. The girls would call my office saying, you know, I was just followed home from school. Black Lincoln Navigator just going slowly behind me. Epstein gets his attorneys to start investigating the accusers, looking into their social media, looking to see if they have any juvenile records. Epstein's lawyers also start sending letters to the prosecutor's office. One in particular calls an alleged victim, quote, untruthful, sexually active, smokes marijuana. The letter also says Mr. Epstein does not use drugs or alcohol and has an unequivocal reputation for being truthful. Epstein's attorneys said, look, hey, these girls are doing bad things. These are bad girls. You're not going to be able to prove your case. Police Chief Ryder says at this point he notices a significant change, and he and his detectives are getting radio silence from the state's attorney's office. I asked the state attorney, Barry Krischer, to stop in my office. He told me all this case was was a misdemeanor. He suggested we write uh, Epstein a notice to appear. It's basically similar format as a traffic ticket. I was basically pleading with him, please reconsider. And uh, he just basically got up and walked out of my office. That's when I sent the state attorney a letter asking him to remove himself from the case. It's very rare in Palm Beach County for somebody to go after the state attorney, but Ryder did. Chief Ryder says he never heard back about his letter. And Barry Krischer stayed on the case. And then nothing much happened for another two and a half months. I opened the newspaper. I was stunned. Epstein had been charged with a single count of solicitation of prostitution. And in the charge, nothing about minors. The Palm Beach Police Department had put together against Jeffrey Epstein. Barry Krischer could have thrown a book at Epstein, and he refused to do it. The former state attorney, Barry Krischer, has not responded to ABC News' efforts to talk to him. Krischer defended his actions in a public statement saying that he presented evidence and witnesses to a grand jury, which returned a single count indictment of felony solicitation of prostitution. Calling these girls prostitutes is a very offensive thing. We weren't prostitutes. We weren't whores. We were children. I needed to let them know it doesn't end with this. They did the only thing he could do, which is take it to the FBI. The FBI begins a nationwide investigation. He's got homes in New York, Virgin Islands, New Mexico, and that becomes particularly perilous for Epstein. He may have underestimated the determination of many of the victims. Mr. Epstein, how long have you been sexually attracted to underage minor females? Are you kidding? minors into sex acts with you. Didn't care. He doesn't care. For him, I think people are a sport. Jeffrey was dirty. He was sick. He was a pedophile. Gilen, she is the wicked one. Tonight, the latest on Gilen Maxwell. Arrested after a year in hiding. Charged with procuring girls for Jeffrey Epstein. He was molesting underage girls multiple times a day. So she's again who? And everybody was okay with it. Like vampires needed fresh blood consistently. I want to know when we're going to court. I want to be there. I want to stand up for myself. 
So does this mean that he just gets away with it? It makes me so mad. The law matters. Why does it not matter for him? Galen has social entree to many of the world's most powerful and richest families. This one is the little black book, Holy Grail. It's a who's who of who's in Epstein's world. She has a photograph of herself and Prince Andrew at 17 years old. Prince Andrew should be panicking at the moment. The victims are determined to blow the lid on Epstein's alleged comments. He flies in from Paris, he lands on the tarmac, and his life is about to change. He had no idea what was about to come. On prostitution charges, 53-year-old Jeffrey Epstein was arrested in Palm Beach where investigators say he paid women to have sex with him in his mansion. The police have been working on this investigation for a long time. They felt like they had a lot of evidence that Epstein was running a child sex ring. To return a single solicitation of prostitution charge just makes no sense. It wasn't fair. It wasn't justice. Epstein immediately posts bond and he's free. But the Palm Beach police chief is now furious and he wants the FBI to take over. And they do. When they heard the way it was handled in the state court, they told us, of course, this is it's not enough. This is a guy we really have to stop. The FBI picked up where the Palm Beach Police Department left off and began uncovering more and more victims. And one of those alleged victims is Maria Farmer. It's 2006. I'm 36 years old. I'm in North Carolina in the mountains. And then somebody knocks on the door. She's an agent. I immediately said to her, are you here about my student loans? And she said, no, 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 we're here about your 1996 FBI report. Back in 1996, Maria Farmer says she told the FBI about her alleged assault by Epstein and his friend Galen Maxwell. And she says she told them about this strange parade of schoolgirls going in and out of his New York mansion. The FBI, as a matter of policy, declined to comment for this report. I remember just kind of being shocked that they were actually going to follow through 10 years later. The prosecutor at the time was Alexander Acosta, who went on to become labor secretary under President Trump. He led me to believe that he would do his job and that he recognized this as a very serious case. The feds had a 53-page indictment ready to go, listing serious charges. Courtney Wilde is another victim who has been cooperating with the federal investigation. But after a while, she says she was having difficulty getting answers from the government about what was going on and she started to get concerned i would call them and say hi my name is courtney wild i'm a victim of jeffrey epstein can you tell me what's happening with this case nobody would ever call me back i jumped in my car and i went and met brad that day i agreed to represent her for free i explained i want to know when we're going to court i want to be there i want to stand up for myself public at the time, but we now know that there was this intense, months-long lobbying effort by Epstein's high-powered defense attorneys trying to convince the government to settle the case and end the federal investigation. He isn't just a rich guy with a curse. It was like an O.J. Simpson dream team. There are emails after emails that show the United States Attorney's Office negotiating with Epstein's attorneys. The discussion between the government and Jeffrey Epstein is basically what charge will Jeffrey Epstein accept? Would he like a misdemeanor here? One document was more shocking than the next document. I believed that there was some imminent deal between the federal government and Jeffrey Epstein. There is a Crime Victims' Rights Act which entitles victims to be informed of what's happening. You can't keep all the information to yourself and not just tell us anything about what I knew that there was something important that was about to happen that I had to stop. So I started drafting a pleading. Within four days of me filing this emergency petition, I'm getting a hearing. Courtney was sitting in the front row. I walked to the podium and the very first words out of my mouth were, Your Honor, he may just be the most dangerous sexual 
predator in U.S. history. And just moments later at that same hearing, a prosecutor tells the court about the secret deal between Epstein and the federal government. My clients and I are learning for the first time that not only is a deal done, but that it was done many, many months before. That deal? That there would be no federal charges. Turns out Epstein had been allowed to quietly take a plea in state court to that one count of solicitation of prostitution plus one charge of solicitation of a minor. It was like being struck by a bus and not knowing what hit you. He went from facing decades to having 18 months in jail. He got the deal of a lifetime. Secret negotiations beforehand? Secret non-prosecution agreement? Also, in the non-prosecution agreement, it gave immunity to his co-conspirators, any and all others who may have helped him. All potential co-conspirators, known or unknown, complete immunity for nothing in return. Why, in God's name, as a U.S. attorney, would you ever enter into a deal like that it just felt surreal they excluded the victim from the solution entirely i just felt betrayed we never received the courtesy of a call to say that we actually settled with this raging pedophile no one ever called us no one contacted your legal system you know who is it there for it's for the rich and, and famous i guess Part of the plea, Epstein has to register as a sex offender. But even in serving his sentence, Epstein's cut breaks. After a few months, Epstein gets work release privileges, which means that for up to seven days a week, up to 16 hours a day, he can leave the jail and go to his office. It's mind-boggling the breaks that he has got. But while the criminal case is over, Epstein's victims are preparing to fight back. Courtney said, we're not stopping. There's no quit in her. So, unfortunately for the U.S. Attorney's Office and for Jeffrey Epstein, they got the wrong person on the other side if they think that she's going to back down. The victims are determined to blow the lid on Epstein's alleged crimes. The accusations against him expand beyond Palm Beach, especially allegations from a young woman named Virginia Roberts. She claims that she was loaned out to Prince Andrew. And she has a photograph of herself at 17 years old. That was pretty stunning. Do you know Virginia Roberts? Can you spell it? At the crack of dawn Wednesday, a black sedan sped away from the Palm Beach County Jail. Its passenger, Palm Beach billionaire Jeffrey Epstein. After a year in jail, Epstein is a free man. This deal, from Epstein's perspective, was a huge win. His attorney says he is ready to move on. The sentencing that he got and the leniency that he got made me want to seek revenge almost. It makes me so mad. The law matters. Why does it not matter for him? We want to know, why did this happen? He came out of jail feeling more untouchable than ever. But he may have underestimated the determination of many of the victims. Courtney Wilde files a lawsuit against the government, alleging that they illegally made this deal without consulting with the victims as is required by federal law. Courtney is also suing Jeffrey Epstein for the sexual abuse that he committed against her. And dozens of other victims are also suing Jeffrey Epstein. This is a videotaped deposition of Jeffrey Epstein. We were able to subpoena witnesses, take depositions. Can you tell us your full name for the record? Jeffrey Edward Epstein. Isn't it true that you pay your employees to bring you underage minor females for sex? Isn't it true that you have made the statement? The younger, the better. In every single deposition. Time. No matter how much I'd like to. On advice of my counsel, I assert my federal constitutional right under the fifth. I'm going to take the fifth. Mr. Epstein, how long have you been sexually attracted to underage minor females? Objection, harassing, argumentative. Are you kidding? He was narcissistic, arrogant, overconfident, felt he was untouched. 
part of my goal was to see if I could figure out a question that would be so embarrassing to him that maybe he would say something that would be really stupid, regardless of what his lawyers were telling him to do. Is it true, sir, that um, you have what's been described as an egg-shaped penis? He smirks. He gets a smile on his face. I can tell through his body reaction that he was annoyed. And as soon as his lawyers give him an out, he gets up and walks out of the room. And that was it. Shortest deposition I think I've ever taken in 23 years. It's over in less than 60 seconds. I also am deposing Epstein's staff and former staff trying to find answers. One person questioned is Epstein's longtime assistant, Sarah Kellen, who was identified in Epstein's deal with the government as a potential co-conspirator. Are you aware of Jeffrey Epstein's sexual obsession for children? And ask him if Jeffrey Epstein went to the moon. She's not going to answer the question. Instruction, my lawyer, must have got my fifth amendment right. Today, Sarah Kellen claims she was targeted by Epstein and Maxwell. She says that shortly after she met them, that Epstein began to sexually abuse her. She claims that at no time did she recruit anyone on Epstein or Maxwell's behalf. Lawyers are deposing witnesses, pouring over documents. One piece of evidence in particular is going to expose how global, how well-connected, how powerful Epstein really was. There's more files here, and this one is the... Little black book, Holy Grail, all of the numbers of the rich and famous. It was just a stack of computerized sheets with addresses and names. It's a who's who of who's in Epstein's world. Numbers for Prince Andrew, numbers for the Duchess of York. There was Bill Clinton and Donald Trump. Presidents, heads of state, heads of industry. It appears many of those connections were forged by his longtime friend, Ghislaine Maxwell. There wasn't really anybody that Ghislaine didn't know or couldn't get to know very quickly. She spoke the Queen's English. She was very well educated, uh, spoke several languages. I started uh, diving when I was nine, having become passionate about the ocean, watching Jacques Cousteau on TV. And it was Ghislaine Maxwell who would be part of one of the most damning allegations made by a woman named Virginia Roberts. Virginia Roberts filed a complaint. She detailed how she was recruited by Ghislaine Maxwell and used almost as a sex slave to Jeffrey Epstein, that she was lent out by Jeffrey Epstein to some of his friends. This is a big deal because she's the first minor to accuse Epstein of loaning her out to other men. And in court filings, she alleges Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell instructed her to have sex with Prince Andrew. The story exploded like a bombshell. Now to the growing royal scandal on the cover of every paper. Bring it the latest now on that explosive scandal rocking the royal family. And she has a photograph of herself at 17 years old in Ghislaine Maxwell's apartment where it is her, Ghislaine, and Prince Andrew. Virginia Roberts spoke to the BBC about her allegations. Ghislaine tells me that I have to do for Andrew what I do for Jeffrey. And that made me sick. It was disgusting. He got up and he said thanks and walked out. And I sat there in bed just horrified and ashamed and felt dirty. Prince Andrew has denied all of these allegations. In his deposition, Jeffrey Epstein appears to have trouble remembering who she is. Even though, according to his flight log, Virginia Roberts, then only 17, had been on his plane more than 20 times with him. Do you know Virginia Roberts? So, so again, who? Virginia Roberts. Can you spell it? According to Virginia, it was Glenn who groomed the victims. Not only Virginia, but many other victims. Virginia Roberts claims that Glenn was basically her madam. Glenn Maxwell has denied Virginia Roberts' allegations, saying they're false. And just when you thought this story couldn't be any darker, allegations surface that not only were women preyed on, but also their younger sisters. It did not occur to me that this 
could potentially also happen to my sister. That's the most egregious part of this. I didn't want her to get hurt. Shante Davies came from a troubled background, in and out of homelessness. In 2001, she's in her early 20s. She's living in Los Angeles, an aspiring actress. She's also in training to be a masseuse. When one day, she says, her massage teacher asks her to come along on an appointment, and the client turns out to be Dylan Mack. Dylan gave her the opportunity to work as a private masseuse for Jeffrey Epstein, who's this billionaire with jets and homes and islands. They said we're going to Jeffrey's Island in the Caribbean. Didn't actually even know that people could actually buy islands. We landed on St. Thomas and then we got on a boat and we drove to his island across turquoise waters. There was different villas all over the place. A gym, a pool. It was very intoxicating. Shantae Davies would later tell a court that her experience on the island took a dark turn when she was called in to give Epstein a massage. I started to massage him and uh, he yanked me down on top of the bed and pulled me on top of him. I said, please no. That was, that was all I could get out of my mouth. He finished and I ran out Back to my villa, barefoot. I just felt like I was just trapped, like there's nowhere for me to go. And, you know, who was I going to tell? Gilan? In the case of Jeffrey Epstein, the victims felt not only powerless, but they felt seduced. They felt ashamed. Who am I going to tell? I don't see how anyone can help me stop this. So they really probably felt very stuck. I had already come from a background in which I had been taught to accept abuse. Um, it just became a situation where I just got deeper, deeper into it, and I didn't know how to pull myself out, really. Shanti Davies continued to occasionally work for and travel with Epstein and Maxwell. But it turns out that Epstein had allegedly uh, taken a particular interest in Shantae's younger sister, Tila, who was just 17 at the time. She says that Epstein promised to send her abroad to study and transform her life. Tila Davies would later go public. And in a lawsuit, she alleged... Jeffrey Epstein preyed upon me. He put me in a vulnerable and dependent situation and took advantage of me. I was only 17 years old. I was a little girl. Tila told me what was happening. I told him that I knew what he had done to my sister. He told me that life is about reality, not about dreams, and that he hung up on me. And I never talked to him again. Using an older sister to get to a younger sister is something that Jeffrey did many times over and over again. You see the sister playbook, which Epstein deployed with other, you know, girls as well. And that happened with Maria Nanny Farmer. Maria Farmer was that artist in New York City who had met Epstein in the 1990s. She says that Epstein and Maxwell were excited to find out that she had a sister who was 10 years younger than her. Fairly early on, Jeffrey Nealon took an interest in the details about my sister. And Annie is right in the age range that is Jeffrey's sweet spot. She's a 16-year-old kid. What I understood was that Maria had a very wealthy boss and that he might want to help me with school. And I just thought, well, this could be a good thing. Jeffrey had promised the eventual Ivy League education for the 16-year-old Annie. Epstein persuaded Annie to come to him at his, his ranch in New Mexico. The spiel was that there was going to be a number of high-achieving students there. 
Jeffrey first called me to ask me if Annie could come to their ranch in Santa Fe. And I said, who's going to be the chaperone? And he said, Gillan. Annie gets there. There is no school program. It's just Jeffrey, Gillan, and now 16-year-old Annie. Annie Farmer says in court documents that what happens next is that Maxwell repeatedly tells her that she wants to give her a massage. And Annie Farmer says she felt uncomfortable but pressured to comply. She said, okay, you, you know, get undressed and then come lay on the table. And she, you know, touches me around my chest. This was such a scary situation for me. So I just needed to, like, just to manage that and to go on as if everything was normal. At one point, Epstein gets into bed with Annie, which she's totally freaked out by. Like, no adult man is going to crawl into bed with you and, and have, you know, and that, that that's okay. I do remember making an excuse that I needed to go to the bathroom, that that would not be something he would be expecting to continue. Annie was very quiet when she got home from the trip. Every time I asked a question about it, she just said she was tired and she didn't really want to think about it. My sister never shared with me anything about what had transpired with Gilan and Jeffrey. Maria Farmer says it wasn't until a few months later, after her own alleged assault by Epstein and Maxwell, that she talked to Annie about it. I didn't want her to get hurt. So that's the most egregious part of this. They were master manipulators. I think that it's a particular type of, of sickness that they displayed in um, taking advantage of, you know, uh, the love you have for a sibling. He doesn't care. He really doesn't care. <laughs> for him, I think people are a sport. They were like vampires. They needed fresh blood consistently. He had, through the years, almost convinced me that he really was untouchable. He flies in from Paris on July 6th. He lands on the back in Teterboro, New Jersey, and his life is about to change. Multi-billionaire Jeffrey Epstein tonight arrested and charged with sex trafficking. I'm looking at my phone and then I just start getting text messages from friends saying, did you see this? I just couldn't believe that it had actually happened. In 2010, after his sentence was served, it seemed it was life back to normal for Epstein. And for his victims, probably seemed untouchable as he spent more and more time at his private island retreat. Epstein decided to change residencies and to live on the island permanently. He was renovating the entire home. By 2018, Epstein probably feels like he's put this thing behind him. And then the Miami Herald comes out with an in-depth article about this plea deal that occurred behind the victim's backs. And the public hears from some of his Palm Beach victims. I had this extreme fear that everything that me and a few of the other girls did with the Herald and talking, that made me nervous now that he was going to come after us. And then there's another issue for Epstein. There's also this ongoing civil lawsuit filed by Courtney Wilde and her lawyer, Bradley Edwards, to try and hold the government accountable for not informing the victims about the deal. The victims had to meaningfully confer with the prosecutor in the case before it was resolved. When a federal judge says the government broke the law, this was a huge victory for Courtney and other victims. That victory happens in a very different political climate than 2008. The Me Too movement is in full swing, and Alex Acosta, the prosecutor who made that so-called sweetheart deal with Epstein, is now the Secretary of Labor for President Donald Trump. Even as all these developments are happening in the background, all these civil suits across the country, Jeffrey Epstein is still living his best life. He flies in from Paris on July 6th. Jeffrey Epstein almost certainly thought that most of his troubles were behind him. 
He had no idea what was about to come. Multi-millionaire Jeffrey Epstein was arrested Saturday for alleged sex trafficking of girls in Florida and New York. It's been such a long time that I've waited for this this one day just to happen, and it's finally come. Marie actually received a text, and she just yelled, and I didn't know what had happened. And then she read it, and then I'm just I'm looking at my phone, and then I just start getting text messages from you know, other people involved. We were so excited. We literally jumped up and down. We were, we were both crying. It's definitely, I feel relief. I do feel relief. But having said that, there's still a very powerful feeling of... Okay, what's going to happen next? Uh, we're going to begin now with the arrest of the mega-wealthy financier Jeffrey Epstein. Today in court, prosecutors laid out the details and certain parts of their investigation. Just two days after his arrest, I was right there at the federal courthouse. It was a media frenzy. And behind all of this are the victims. It's been 10 years they've been fighting, so they come to court to see Jeffrey Epstein in person, including Courtney Wilde, who never let this go. For the first time, I get to see face-to-face -face the person who sexually abused me for years. Yeah, thank you. He's in federal custody. He's in handcuffs. Thank you. We have a news conference here in New York City on sex trafficking charges against billionaire financier Jeffrey Epstein just emotional it's just a lot i just been waiting for this for so long you know today we announce the unsealing of sex trafficking charges against jeffrey epstein victims voices including the many voices of epstein's alleged victims must be heard just to hear that they're standing up for the victims you know what i mean it's just like so overwhelmingly un do you know the first court apparently saw him look resigned he's wearing prison garb which is exactly the same as what everybody else has to wear i never heard him speak except for the not guilty when you saw him it just brought back bad memories yeah it brought back the last time i saw him which was right there at the massage table and it just started making me feel Today was a bittersweet. I got to see him. It brought back a lot of memories, but in the same way, it's like, okay, I can start to move on. Like, the, there is hope. Like, our stories are, are mattering. And nobody is wanting to mess up what's going to happen to him because everybody is paying attention. Jeffrey Epstein's money, Jeffrey Epstein's connections weren't going to get him out of this case. And those associated with him, those that he cut deals with, are going to have to answer some very tough questions. Their judgment's going to come. They better be ready for the consequences. Thanks for joining us. We are coming on the air with breaking news. Sources tell ABC News Jeffrey Epstein took his own life. Epstein was found dead in his cell in an apparent suicide by hanging. Just a month after his arrest, the crusade by the victims of Jeffrey Epstein to hold him accountable in a court of law comes to a surprising and shocking end. Epstein was found in his cell unresponsive here at MCC at about 6.30 this morning. There are mounting calls for an investigation into how this could even happen. Why wasn't Epstein on suicide watch after a previous attempt on his life? Who's to blame for the system's failure? My heart surged racing and i was just like this has to be fake there's a lot of questions surrounding um his death i mean are you kidding me now they've made sure we never know everything there's no way that guy took his life i was yearning for the moment to look him in the eye i needed him to hear my words and, and that that justice has been robbed from me and from from for many others the u.s office is flying the victims out to speak at a hearing tomorrow morning to have a chance to be able to be heard all right guys stay no bark mommy always comes back i love you be good i feel like i cannot wait to speak the only thing of course for me is missing is the fact that the one person who i really needed to hear this was is not going to be there now you know this is breaking.
confused. A chance for dozens of Jeffrey Epstein accusers to have their voices heard in court before the sex trafficking case against the late financier comes to an end. It's unusual for victims to give impact statements after the defendant is dead. But these victims had been wronged for a lot of years. And I think the judge just felt the right thing to do is finally to let them have their say. Most of us spoke and we said what we had to say, but it was like reliving and going back to that 14 year old girl to me walking up his staircase. Jeffrey Epstein robbed myself and all the other victims of our day in court to confront him one by one. And for that, he is a coward. What happened to me occurred many years ago when I was in high school, but it still affects my life. I will not stop fighting and I will not be silenced anymore. Even after these victims are able to testify in court, they still want accountability for the people they say helped Jeffrey Epstein with his sexual recruitment network. It makes me sick to my stomach that there's per perpetrators out there that obviously helped him in many ways for a very long time and they're still out there with no punishment. But the victims also have a lot of questions for the federal government. After Epstein's arrest, an intense spotlight is focused on the labor secretary, Alex Acosta. He's the former federal prosecutor who made that controversial deal with Epstein back in Palm Beach. Did someone at DOJ tell you or order you to cut a deal with Jeffrey Epstein? When the career attorneys met with him, they presented certain terms. And the office stayed true to those terms throughout. We believe that we proceeded appropriately. Based on the evidence, there was value to getting a guilty plea. Under relentless questioning, just nine days later, Acosta resigns his post. So I called the president this morning. I told him that I thought the right thing was to step aside. There were also questions for billionaire Les Wexner. Wexner said he cut ties with him in 2007 and had no idea Epstein was a sexual predator. Wexner also told his investors that Epstein had misappropriated at least $46 million from him and his family. Being taken advantage of by someone who was uh, so sick, so cunning, uh, so depraved is something that I'm embarrassed that I was even close to. But perhaps the most prominent name that's remained in the news since Epstein's death has been Prince Andrew. What do you make of Prince Andrew's denial? Comment on that? He has been outspoken. He knows exactly what he's done, and uh... Andrew speaks out. In a rare interview with the BBC, Prince Andrew said he was unaware of Epstein having sex with underage girls. He denied having sex with Virginia Roberts, questioned even meeting her. I have no recollection of ever meeting this lady. None whatsoever. We can't be certain as to whether or not that's my hand on, on, on her, uh, whatever it is, left, left side. Just to clarify, sir, you think that photo has been faked? Nobody can prove uh, whether or not... It, um, it, it, that photograph has been doctored, but I don't recollect that photograph ever being taken. The interview turned out to be a total disaster for the prince, forcing him to resign from his official royal duties. But for at least some of Epstein's victims, and, and really any reporter who's covered this case, there still remains one person everyone wants to talk to. We need to get to the bottom of everybody who was involved with that, starting with Elon Maxwell. For almost a year after Epstein's death, Glenn Maxwell is seemingly nowhere to be found. Speculation has abounded for several days as to the whereabouts of Ghislaine Maxwell. Where is Jeffrey Epstein's former girlfriend? She's vanished. All eyes are on the 57-year-old British socialite. Reporters want to find her. Civil attorneys want to talk to her. One of the single biggest mysteries now is where in the world is Ghislaine Maxwell? For there to be justice, real justice, many of the victims want to know, will Ghislaine Maxwell be held accountable for her alleged role? We begin with the FBI's arrest of Jeffrey Epstein's longtime associate, Ghislaine Maxwell. Maxwell is seemingly nowhere to be found, but all along, federal authorities had been discreetly keeping an eye on her and tracking her location. The FBI arresting Jeffrey Epstein. 
ex-girlfriend, Ghislaine Maxwell, at a secluded property in New Hampshire. She was found at this uh, 156-acre property. It was called Tucked Away, and had been purchased just a few months earlier in an all-cash transaction. She had slithered away to a gorgeous property in New Hampshire, continuing to live a life of privilege while her victims live with the trauma inflicted upon them years ago. Ghislaine Maxwell is now facing six counts, including conspiracy and perjury. The charges involve three minor victims from 1994 to 1997. Maxwell enticed minor girls, got them to trust her, then delivered them into the trap that she and Epstein had set for them. Maxwell has not yet entered a plea to the charges, but she has addressed similar knowledge of trafficking or abuse, saying, as far as I'm concerned, everyone who came to his house was an adult professional person. Going on to say, I'm not aware of teenagers who worked in his home. Pointing out, it's important to understand that I wasn't with Jeffrey all the time. In fact, I was only in the house less than half the time, so I cannot testify to when I wasn't in the house. But federal authorities say she lied during those depositions, and she's now facing two perjury charges for some of her statements. Maxwell's arrest has again put a spotlight on Prince Andrew. We would welcome Prince Andrew coming in to talk with us. There's a clear disconnect going on here. The prosecutors in New York for months have been saying that they want to talk to Prince Andrew, but that he's been uncooperative. A source close to the prince says... His team has reached out to the Department of Justice twice in the last month and haven't heard back. This photo recently surfaced of her with Kevin Spacey sitting on the thrones at Buckingham Palace. Reportedly, it's from a behind-the-scenes tour Prince Andrew uh, gave them in 2002. Prince Andrew should be panicking at the moment uh, because Ghislaine doesn't really care about anyone else but Ghislaine. Maxwell now is in a federal detention center in Brooklyn across the river from the facility in Manhattan where Epstein died last August. According to law enforcement officials, Ghislaine Maxwell was given paper clothes in fear she might take her own life. The federal government says Maxwell is an extreme flight risk. They want to keep her behind bars until trial. Today, in a court filing, Maxwell's attorneys are saying that she vigorously denies the charges and intends to fight them. They say she's not a flight risk and that she never once left the United States in the year since Epstein's arrest and that she should be let out on bail until trial. The simplest point, they argued, is the most critical one. Ghislaine Maxwell is not Jeffrey Epstein. My clients, they were very emotional when they heard that she was arrested. There could not have been a Jeffrey Epstein without Ghislaine Maxwell. I absolutely stopped painting because of Epstein, and in a weird way, I kind of started painting again because of him, because I wanted to honor the victims. These are the survivors that are still standing. I wanted it to portray how beautiful these women are and how strong they are, but also how determined they are, because they did survive. Now I have three kids, and I'm in a very healthy and stable relationship, which is super amazing. I'm working at a church. I work for my parents at their cafe. I have a couple of dogs, I go to the drive-in. My life is, is a good life. I'm a psychologist. Part of what I do now is I work with people that have experienced trauma. I'm a nanny to three amazing kids. Um, I live with my two dogs. I'm expecting my first child. Chante's baby girl was born this spring. I have a seven-year-old son and I'm a waitress. I just have a very regular, normal life. The only way that the criminal justice system is going to work is if the victims have a voice, not just the victims in this case, but in future cases. We have to make sure that it never happens again. This is a great moment we're being heard and people are believing us 